In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. With the grace of God, we will continue our studies into the book of Hebrews. We have uh, finished our uh, reading into the first and the second chapter, and today we will read through the third chapter. But before we do so, quickly revise with you a quick summary of the contents of the first and the second one. In the first chapter, we have seen how the writer of the epistle is comparing the Lord with the angels. And in a very concise and a very excellent way, he showed us a sevenfold description of his glory in the first three and a half verse. And Kloon concluded that paragraph in verse four by saying, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. After that, he quoted seven quotations from the Old Testament as evidence to what he was saying about the Lord as the Son of God. So we subtitle this uh, chapter or the first chapter as Jesus, the Son of God. Then he moves into the second chapter and opened it by a warning note uh, that we should give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And the things we have heard here refers to everything that God has spoken to uh, uh, mankind over the years over the ages, first through his prophets and at last through uh, in his son. Uh, he continued in the second chapter to compare Jesus with the angels, but from a different aspect or a different angle. And we subtitled that chapter as the Jesus, the son of man. Um, in the middle of that chapter, in a very genius way, he gave a quick summary, a very comprehensive summary of the story of man <clears throat> from creation, how man was given authority over all creation, and how he lost his authority, and then how through God's wonderful plan to restore him back, and through the coming of the Lord Jesus and his incarnation, he was restored to his original position, if not by far better. Again, uh, in order to reinforce what he is saying or his explanation, he quoted exact words from Psalm 8. After that, he continues to say that through incarnation or by God taking to himself flesh and blood, he managed to die for us and hence he was for a while put a little lower than angels. And he concluded that chapter by saying that uh, in the last two verses of, uh, of this chapter, he says, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, which is us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. And here reveals another function of uh, the Lord in things pertaining to God, to make propitations to, uh, for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And this last verse is very touching and it's very important for us. It's very important for us reminding ourselves that our Lord, as he suffered, he feels, he understands, and he meditates on our behalf. And as he is able to aid those who are tempted. So whenever we go through tribulations or certain temptations or difficulties 
we know that the best person to go to because he will understand the exact feelings as we we do is uh, Jesus Christ because he has been through uh, the same when he was uh, when he was in flesh from these last two verses of chapter 2 we can carry on reading into chapter 3 because as if the beginning of chapter 3 is a quick summary of what has been said in chapter 1 and 2 as a whole. We read it together and it says here, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. I will stop here, and it's only one verse, but it includes many words, and each of the words that within this verse need a little while to look at and to think about and understand. First of all, he says, therefore, and he's referring to what's been said before, all the explanations that was given in the first and the second chapter. And when he talks to his people, to these people, he calls them holy brethren. And holy brethren, and that applies to all of us, we are holy because of the sanctification of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second description is the word partakers of the heavenly calling. And I want you to watch two things. We are partakers of what? Of the heavenly calling. So we are partakers of the calling, like an invitation. We all actually have got the same invitation, the same call to go and enter and accept this invitation to enter the heavenly kingdom. But we watch together as he continue in this first part of this chapter. It is, he was going to continue to compare Jesus Christ with Moses. And the call of Moses was an earthly one. He called his people out of Egypt through the wilderness into the, the promised land. So that was an earthly call. Yes, he freed them from the bondage of the Pharaoh, but as opposed to the call of Jesus Christ, he, his calling is into the heavenly kingdom. So his calling, or his call here, is a heavenly one. And this call is for all his people. He came for the salvation of the whole world. In other words, when, we, when he describes here the people he is talking to as partakers of the heavenly calling, does not mean that all these people that he's talking to have acquired salvation in the true sense because it's up to the person to accept it or not. And the other thing is, he, he, here he is talking about a heavenly call as opposed to an earthly call, which we will mention later on when he compares Jesus with Moses. And he, he says, consider. And the word consider here is not the best, perhaps it's not linguistically, is not the best word to describe what the writer of this epistle meant to say. The true meaning of consider here, what it carries from, a meaning, is that we should watch, keep an eye on, never lose sight of. So that's the word consider. And then he tells us on what we consider, on what we give the utmost attention by saying the apostle and the high priest of our confession. And if anything here, these two descriptions of the Lord are more or less a summary of the chapter 1 and 2. He describes him as the apostle and the high priest of our confession. I'll talk about our confession in a minute. But let us just first look at the word apostle and high priest. Basically, as 
God has spoken to us by his son or in his son. So in other words, God has sent his ultimate message to humanity in his son. And hence, the son, part, one of his jobs or functions is the apostle, being the apostle. Because he came down with the message from God. And that is more or less a summary of the first chapter. Second word, or the second function, is high priest. And if you notice that the end of chapter 2 was talking about him as the high priest, taken from within his people. So after taking flesh and, flesh and blood, after he has completed salvation, the act of salvation, he, redemption for our sins, he ascended to heaven, and now he is continuously acting as the high priest on our behalf. So the second description, or the second word, which is the high priest, summarizes his function, which was elaborated upon in the second chapter. So how amazing this sentence is in a couple of words showing us the two most important functions of the Lord. But he says here, he is the apostle and high priest of our confession. The word confession is not confession as we confess uh, to the uh, father of confession or something like that, but confession here is in the meaning of Confessing our faith. Confessing our belief. So, he is describing him as the apostle and high priest of our faith. Okay, so that is the first verse. And as I said, in the first verse, each word has got an important meaning that we have to stop by and explain. We'll continue. Second verse for onwards, and it says here, who, who was faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses, also was faithful in all his house. house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Here he starts with the comparison between Jesus and Moses. Uh, and you notice that this is the second figure next to the angels that uh, Paul is comparing Jesus with. And Moses was a big figure in the eyes of the Jews because, as we said before, they considered him as a savior because he saved them or led them from the bondage of captivity in the land of Egypt into the wilderness, crossing with them uh, to reach the promised land. However, before we compare or think about the comparison, let us look at areas of resemblance between the two, in which aspects Jesus and Moses were resembling each other. Moses, when he was born, he was described as a beautiful child. The Lord was described as the most beautiful in all mankind. Moses, as we said, was a savior for his people from the captivity or the bondage or slavery in Egypt. Jesus was a savior of the whole world from the bondage of the devil. Moses came down with the covenant, the old covenant or the Old Testament, between God and his people in the form of the law. But the Lord came down and through him we knew grace and truth, as John described him in the first chapter of his gospel. Moses saw the glory of God, if you go back to chapter 33 of the uh, book of Exodus. The Lord himself, as was described at the beginning of this epistle, 
as the brightness of his glory and the expression or ex express the image of his person. But here in the second verse, he says, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, talking about God the Father, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So, faithfulness is a character for both of them. But by far, the comparison is not equal. Because if we look about how faithful the Lord and how faithful was Moses, there's a big difference. Faithfulness of Moses was a relative one compared to the absolute faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And although Moses was described here as faithful, what he stopped him from stepping into the promised land the promised land was that at some point he fell out of this faithfulness. When God asked him to speak to the rock to get water out and he hit the rock twice and after that God told him because you have to, you and Aaron trespassed against me in referring to this event or this occasion you will not you will see the land from a distance but you will not enter them so we can we notice here that the faithfulness of Moses is not absolute, is not complete, is a relative one. But when we look at how faithful Jesus Christ was, we I will refer you to chapter 2 of the Epistle to the Philippians, and we will read together from verse 6. It says, Who, being in the form of God, did not consider, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And you can see here that his obedience was to the last minute to the point of death. So he was completely obedient in his life on earth, in flesh, to God the Father. So his faithfulness is an absolute one compared to the relative faithfulness of Moses. And he continues in verse 3, he says, For this one, referring to Jesus Christ, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. What does that mean? The Lord is worthy of by far much glory. He is the glorious Son of God. Although Moses gained some glory out of his faithfulness <clears throat> on what he was appointed to do, Moses was a servant, was delegated the job to look after God's house. And God's house here is not, we're not talking about the tabernacle or the house built in stones. But he, he refers here to God's people making his house. But because Moses is one of this house, but was given or delegated to look after that house as opposed to Jesus Christ who was the owner of the house and it continues to say in verse 4 for every house is built by someone but he who built all things is God <clears throat> now he is referring from who, who we are all derived from he is the builder of the house he is the maker of all of us but Moses, and in verse 5, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. And look at that word, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, and comparing now, 
as a son over his own house. So Moses was a servant, but Christ is the son of God. He is the son of the owner, or he is the owner of the house. Whose house we were, we are, and here explains what I said before, that he's not talking about a house, about a house as a building, but as us forming the house. So it says here, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So we form, we truly form the house, or the house is built of us as we are living stones, only in one case, when we hold fast the confidence, we stick to our faith, don't drift off. And we clinch on our hope firm to the end. And that's that part immediately reminds me of the second chapter of uh, St. Peter's epistle, of first, the first epistle, when he says uh, from verse 4, we'll read it together, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men. And now he's referring to the Lord Jesus. So he says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, us now, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. So here is the house. It is not material house. It is a spiritual house. And that the, build, the building of that house is being made of us as living stones. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. And he refers to a part from the Old Testament to say, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So this part, this paragraph, when St. Peter was writing his second, uh, first epistle, he was talking about the spiritual house, the spiritual building, which is built of or formed of living stones, which is the believer, which is us. <clears throat> and that's exactly the same as Paul was talking about in the, uh, that part that we read together from uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. But here is more explained when St. Peter was writing it, and he refers to the Lord himself as the cornerstone. He is the living but cornerstone. And that, he says, rejected indeed by men. And he quoted that reference when he says, the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. What is he referring to here? What's the story of that stone that was rejected by the builders but became later on the cornerstone? When Solomon started to build the temple, as by God's instructions, he sent his people to get stones from Lebanon. It's got a meaning this, and I will say it to you here before we finish this part. Jerusalem was the place where the temple was built. And Jerusalem in the past was a symbol of the heavenly Jerusalem or the heavenly kingdom. In the heavenly kingdom, there is no place for corrections, for repentance. And anyone who enters the heavenly kingdom is correct, is worthy of inheriting the heavenly kingdom. 
and the stones that come from Lebanon are a symbol for us as we come from the world. So the builders would go to Lebanon to get the, cut the stones from the mountain, cut them in a certain shape, and treat them in certain ways to be even corners, so that when they enter Jerusalem, there is no way that a chisel or a hammer will touch them. <clears throat> so that's a symbolic meaning of the spiritual dimension of the built of the temple which become us. But at the time it was materialistic for them to understand, but the stones that from which that temple was built came from Lebanon as a symbol of the world, and we are the stones, been living in that world now, getting reshaped and corrected, and be ready to build the heavenly kingdom. During the building of the temple, the builders noticed a stone which is not square edges, was rather different shape, was in the form of a right angle. And they were about, they rejected that stone and they were about to throw it out because they were not allowed to use, as we said, a chisel or a hammer on it. However, just before throwing it out, they noticed that this stone, which is in the form of a right angle, is very important and is very useful to hold the two walls of the building together. So hence, it's called the corner stone which is a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came to his people, he was rejected, but he became the cornerstone for the whole heavenly building or the whole heavenly kingdom. That's why I wanted to read for you this part from the first epistle of St. Peter, because it elaborates on that concept of the spiritual house and the building and the stones, spiritual stones or the living stones, and further explains that paragraph in the uh, epistle to the Hebrews. And here we can see the comparison uh, and we come to the conclusion that by far Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. Jesus is by far more faithful, although Bo Moses was faithful as well, but his faithfulness is an absolute one. And also, we learn that we are belong to Jesus, and we belong to that spiritual house, if we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end to the end of our lives on earth.